Ah, oh, we're live. We're live. Welcome, Good everyone. Good evening, Kira. How are you? Doing well, Michael, and yourself? I'm doing well, and hello to our audience. Uh, we encourage you to drop a note in the chat and let us know where you're watching from. Yeah, we like to see everyone who's joining us today. I can't believe this is our final one of the year, oh, Michael. I know. Final one of the year, so we won't have one in December, What? but we'll definitely be back in spring 2024, right? We'll we will. We yet. will. We don't have the full slate yet, but we will announce it, I expect, before the end of the year. Excellent. Excellent. And just in terms of other announcements, if you joined us for our last Distinguished Lecture Series, we shared that we had some amazing um, grant opportunities coming up. Those are now live. So if you like money, <laughs> check us out. We have some lovely outreach funding opportunities that are now available at MAA. We'll drop a link in the chat um, for any math education outreach programs that you have that math faculty may be working with at their institution at local middle schools or high schools. We encourage you to check out our website um, because we do have some money available that we can give you ranging from $5,000 to $6,000. And also our NRUP program, that'll um, uh, start at $31,500 actually, $31,500 that we have available for folks to run an REU at their institution. So please be sure to check that out. Yeah, some really great programs. I was reminded of that at uh, MathFest this summer when we had the poster session where all Many of the projects were there to talk about yes. their work and the yeah. impact of their work. So really a great way to um, accelerate your ability to do that kind of work and uh, build our community. Absolutely. And we have some other, other data science news coming out, don't we, Michael? Well, that is true. Yeah, tonight's <laughs> talk is about data science. and. It's a great tee up for our new journal, Scatterplot, uh, mm -hmm. on undergraduate uh, data science and undergraduate education, which we will launch in the new year, uh, which as we just noted is very close. So mm -hmm. we're uh, looking forward to getting that out and hope you'll check that out. It's part of our portfolio of journals and um, think about both reading and submitting. Right exciting stuff and and then uh, i understand that the open math team is uh, is working to select from a huge number of proposals for next summer to put together another great program of virtual um uh offerings professional development and other things for next summer so all kinds of things coming up in the next few months really exciting yeah, please do. <laughs> please do. But let's go ahead and start this show off, Michael. All right. Thanks, Kara. <laughs> sure. Uh, how are you? Welcome, welcome, welcome. And thank you for being here tonight. Really excited to hear this as you may have just heard me talk about our new journal, Scatterplot, right down the line here. I'm really uh, excited about that. So, um, Mina Chetinkaya Rundell is a professor of the practice in the Department of Statistical Sciences at Duke University, where she has been since uh, 2011, right after you got your PhD at UCLA, I believe, right? Yeah. And except for a couple of years in Edinburgh. Yes. Where you did some things. So, yep, very cool. And uh, Mina has been extremely involved in developing a whole suite of resources for um, undergraduate education, introductory education in data science and statistics. Um, very, very uh, much an advocate of open access, open uh, source tools. And um, in fact, a second edition of your book, R for Data Science, which mm -hmm. you're a co-author on, just got released this summer, I believe. Yep. Yeah, so check it out, folks. Take a look. There's a great tool for teaching R. And I'm really, I'm really excited, too, because of the emphasis on integrating the technology with learning um, the concepts. I'm a strong advocate for that approach. Um, and uh, I am looking forward 
to learning more about your work as well as, um, you know, maybe I'll even learn what the, what the tidy verse is <laughs> tonight. But in any case, Mina, let's uh, turn it over to you and looking forward to data science in an ever evolving box. All right, thank you very much. And thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to speak to you all. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So, um, you know, as I said, I'm excited to be here and it was wonderful to get this um, invitation to speak to you all. And one of the first things I did when I got the invitation was to take a look to see what other talks have been and what else is sort of on the web page for this event. And one of the things that grabbed my attention on the MAA website was this, it all starts with math. And at the risk of never being invited back again, perhaps I will ask the question, does it? Does it all start with math? And I'm actually doing something tongue in cheek here that I tell my students never to do, which is using the word it without clarifying what I mean. Many, many concepts and ideas in statistics and data science have their foundations in math. So the statement, it all starts with math, in a way holds true. But when we think about our students, the students don't all start with math, at least not in my experience as an educator um, who's been sort of doing this for over a decade and uh, you know, housed in a statistics department. I see students coming into the things we want them to get excited about through a variety of pathways. And not every single one of those students are originally motivated by the math underlying some of these ideas. Many students in my experience and an increasing number over the last decade start with data science. And when we say this, um, oftentimes I get the question, well, what is data science? And, you know, we generally like to start um, sort of our, um, uh, you know, whenever we're sort of introducing a new idea, there are some assumptions that as a statistician, I like to put on the table. And what I want to start by saying is that I understand that there are still sort of evolving definitions of data science. And I think that's what makes it really exciting. Um, but this is sort of the definition of data science that I'm going to stick to today. Uh, this is a, a, a diagram from the book that we just mentioned, R for Data Science, where we sort of, uh, you know, discuss the Krebs cycle, if you will, of data science, where we start by importing some data, tidy it and bring it to shape so that we can transform it, visualize it and model it. And we spend a lot of time in that area before um, we come up with some results and communicate things. So that understand area, you know, and the import and tidy area, these are like what makes a bulk of uh, data science education in my opinion. So inspired by this, um, what we're going to do next is sort of bring up what a data science course might look like that is sort of based on this diagram that we've seen. So I have been developing this data science curriculum for over six years at this point and teaching it both at Duke. And um, as we heard, I taught it for a couple of years at the University of Edinburgh as well, which I think speaks to sort of its versatility across institutions and across different systems even different lengths of semesters. And it's not just me teaching it. Many, many colleagues at Duke are teaching this course, but also many colleagues beyond Duke are teaching uh, from the materials that we've been developing in the data science in a box, which I'll get to before the end of the talk. But let's take a look at this uh, sort of flow for a second. So we start with a week of sort of hello world, uh, introducing the students to the toolkit and the main ideas. And then we go into a lengthy unit on exploring data where we visualize data first that's been cleaned up and ready to be visualized. Then we take a step back and we say, well, what if we need to wrangle this data into shape before we can visualize it? And then we take another step back and ask, what if we need to import the data first before we can wrangle and visualize it? Then we have a week or two, depending on the length of the semester, on uh, data science ethics, where we touch on ideas like misrepresentation of data, particularly in data visualizations and uh, media communication, data privacy, and algorithmic bias. And then we dive into another lengthier unit on making rigorous conclusions, where we talk about modeling, 
uh, particularly from a predictive perspective. And we also talk a little bit about inference as well. And at the end of the semester, uh, we have a week or two, again, depending on the length of the semester and how things have gone, uh, so a unit on looking further. And this is usually where I, you know, try to get adventurous and I encourage others teaching with this curriculum to get adventurous as well, to put something on the syllabus that's perhaps a bit beyond the reach of the students, perhaps something they're not going to be able to fully comprehend at the time, but can inspire them to take that next course in statistics or data science or mathematics or any related field. And we see that all throughout this diagram, we have this thread, the communicate thread running through. So from day one, students are creating, doing computation and doing data analysis in reproducible computational documents. And they're writing up their results along with actually getting those results computationally. So they're doing this throughout the semester as well. So the communicate thing is not just something that happens at the end, but it is something that happens throughout. But there is a big communicate piece that happens at the end, which is a final presentation that they do on a topic of their own choosing. And throughout this talk today, I'm going to give you a few examples of student projects that they have been able to sort of put together in teams as they went through this curriculum. Um, the data science in a box um, has sort of like three big, uh, you know, aspects to it. Data science content, so that's the, uh, the content that we're teaching the students, uh, pedagogy, and tooling. So I am going to be talking about all three of these today, but let's start with content, and we're going to do that in three examples. The first example I want to dive into comes actually towards the very end of the semester. But the reason why I'm bringing it forward here in this talk is that it is a very typical, quote unquote, introductory statistics um, idea. We're going to talk a little bit about inference. Um, there's a wonderful uh, data set from a, a paper called Beauty in the Classroom. Uh, the paper is a little bit old at this point, but the ideas really do stand. Um, and as I said, this is an example that comes at the end of the semester. So it's very apt because it's about course evaluation. So the researchers um, at University of Texas, Austin, um, did a study on how students um, score um, their professors and their courses at the end of the semester. And they also recruited a sample of six undergraduate students to score the attractiveness of the professors as well. And this was a study on sort of the relationship between the evaluation score of the professor and their BD score when we control for other attributes um, that we have on the professors. So what might we do with this data? We bring this uh, to the classroom. And one of the questions that we ask is, a, again, a very standard inference question. Estimate the difference in average evaluation scores of male and female faculty. In this particular study, the gender is coded as a binary variable of male and female. So those are the two groups that we're looking at here. We can see that the mean for the female faculty is a little bit lower than the mean for the male faculty, 4.09 to 4.23. Um, for a data set that's on a range of one to five. And we asked the students the question, um, based on this, can we estimate uh, the difference in average evaluation scores using a confidence interval? So how might we go about this? Well, one approach would be to go about this using methods based on the central limit theorem, which is, would be a very sort of uh, standard approach for um, you know any introductory statistics course, and uh, honestly, my experience for many data science courses as well. If you're teaching with R, this is what uh, the command that you might use might look like, t.test, and then we have a model of score versus gender from the evals data set. The first question is, what's test? Why are we doing a test? <laughs> we're not doing a hypothesis test. We just said we're going to do a confidence interval. So that's usually something that, um, you know, that is a question that comes from the students. And this is what the result of that test looks like. A lot of text gets printed on your screen with very little prompt here. And one of the things uh, that we see is that this is a specific type of test. This is a Welch two sample t-test. We have some t-test information like a t-score, a degrees of freedom and a p-value. And further down the line, hidden in the middle of this output is a confidence interval. A uh, 
score difference of negative 0.24 to negative 0.04. Basically, you know, we're 95% confident that the difference between the female and male average scores is somewhere in this range uh, if we were considering sort of all male and female faculty. Um, the thing is, while the code itself is pretty succinct, um, understanding what is here requires a lot of uh, sort of handle of a lot of ideas. First of all, uh, we need to also be talking about t-tests along with confidence intervals. So you don't get a chance to sort of like phase one and after the other. Um, there are distributions mentioned here. So we would need to actually explain why are we talking about the t-distribution? What, what do the degrees of freedom mean? Um, so while all of these are incredibly important uh, topics in statistics, not all of them should be required, in my opinion, to start talking, be required to start talking about, um, you know, this idea of having a sample and having to and then doing inference for the population from that sample. So what's another approach that might fit better into the end of a sort of the latter half of a uh, introductory data science course where students have been learning computation all along? We could actually use computational methods for doing that. And the nice thing here is that while this does obviously require learning a lot of new ideas as well, um, it doesn't necessarily require learning about distributions and distributional assumptions too. So students can actually layer on their computational knowledge to now use the same sort of types of approaches that they've learned throughout the semester to solve inference problems. How might we go about this? Um, so we can solve this problem using uh, the tidyverse and tidy models pa packages. Um, every single thing that the students do up until this point starts with data pipelines that start with the data frame name. Evals was our data frame name. So we start with that again. We put, and here is what our data frame looks like. We have about 463 uh, courses being evaluated in the data frame. Then we pipe this into a specify function, which specifies the model, that same idea of score versus gender, the same way we would be specifying linear models uh, when we're doing uh, modeling in R as well. And the output of this is, again, a valid output. That's, again, a data frame that happens to include, uh, that is now showing just the variables of interest for us and with some metadata about them telling us what the response variable and what the explanatory variable is. After we specify, we generate and we take uh, bootstrap samples. This basically gives us the output of uh, the observations in each one of our bootstrap samples. So this is where we would pause for a second and talk about what bootstrapping is. And then for each one of these bootstrap samples, we calculate the difference in means. And then finally, we um, that also gives us a valid data frame. And finally, now that we have our bootstrapped uh, differences in means, uh, we can um, get the confidence interval as the 2.5th and the 97.5th percentile of that distribution. Now you'll see that on the screen, I have used colors blue and green to sort of uh, uh, tease apart. What are the functions that come from tidy models, which is an ecosystem that we introduced to the students on the latter half of the course versus tidyverse, which is what they're starting to learn about from day one of the course. So once they have a bootstrap distribution at the end of calculate and we tell them what we want you to do now is to find the 2.5th and 97.5th percentile of this distribution to get the bounds of the middle 95%, the skills that they use are the same skills that they used in week two of the course where they were given a data set and they were asked to find means, medians, and any other percentile. So they're able to bring in what they know into this inferential workflow. This is also, again, a valid data frame as we saw as a result. So they can make a, a visualization of that data frame, a histogram like they're always used to do and sort of like mark um, this, um, the bounds of the confidence interval on this. And then we talk about um, how to interpret this output, what this, these values mean, these bounds mean in the context of the uh, data and the research question. 
And then we do a lot of these. So this was just a single example on differences in means. We could be talking about differences in proportions, uh, a single proportion, a single mean, median, standard deviation, since we're not bound by the sort of the, um, the distributional assumptions about any of them, we are basically saying that we can use this computational approach of generating samples and doing inference based on them for any sample statistic. And what the students see over and over is that these distributions are unimodal and symmetric, whether they're doing randomization based um, inference hypothesis testing or they're doing bootstrapping based uh, confidence intervals. So all of these different examples allow us to talk about sampling variability, uh, we get to um, introduce the idea of bootstrapping a modern method for um, doing um, um, constructing confidence intervals as well as randomization um, for doing hypothesis tests based on simulations. And at the end of each one of these examples, they do a bit of uh, interpreting uh, study results as well. And then where do we leave the students off? They have seen this unimodal and symmetric curve over and over, and we cap this uh, set of lessons on inference with saying this was not happenstance. There is actually theory underlying this called the central limit theorem. We give them a baby introduction to that, but instead of asking them to then memorize a bunch of standard error formulas um, for you know, every different type of test that they might do, we tell them, we're basically at the end of the semester. You've learned a lot. Take another stats course and actually take a stats course that have, that will dive into the mathematical underpinnings of these as well, as opposed to um, what you know, even I used to do um, uh, back in the day when I was teaching introductory statistics, where I would throw a bunch of formulas at the students. But this was a, you know, a introductory statistics course where we didn't really dive into the math. So what we told the students to do was trust us, the central limit theorem does work, and you will learn about it later again. So what we're doing here is, um, you know, giving them the computational tools to actually do the inference, but then capping it with uh, sort of talking about the theory underneath it, and hopefully motivating many of them to take more courses to learn more about it. So we start with an example on inference sort of at the very end of the semester. And I've shown you these pipelines for doing inference. Um, and for some of you, if you do do your data analysis and pipelines like that as well, they might seem very sort of second nature to you. And for some of you, you might be thinking, you know, that is not generally how I write code. So how do we prepare the students throughout the semester to sort of think in these pipelines so that at the end of the semester, um, you know, these inferential pipelines also make sense to them. Let's take a look at one example from very early on in the semester now, an exploratory data now from the exploratory data analysis unit. So uh, in this example, we work with data from Wikipedia on fisheries. And in fact, this was a visualization that was submitted to our, um, the data visualization uh, library folks, our data visualization consultants um, at the library at Duke. And um, they were given this visualization based on some uh, fishery data, and they were asked, how can we fix this up? Well, there's no better way to motivate students than to show them something that is so obviously, you know, not the right thing to do and pretty ugly looking, if you ask me, uh, with these exploding um, uh, pie charts and say, let's critique this. So before we dive into it, let's critique and see what we can do with it. Um, and we also try to make sense of the, uh, the visualization that's shown to us. For example, this um, plot where it looks like we have some right skewed data maybe, turns out is nothing like that. This is not about a skew. We actually have countries at the uh, on the x-axis, not numbers at all. So none of these visualizations really tell us um, how, uh, anything about sort of um, the fishery amount, uh, the fishing amounts in these countries, other than perhaps the fact that lots of, um, you know, wild capture in China and lots of aquaculture, so that is farm fishing also in China as well. So what do we do from here? Um, first, we ask the students, how can we, what may be some ways that we can summarize these data? And inevitably, 
uh, some students will bring up, well, maybe we can bring in some sort of geographic information here. So we have our fisheries data set. And one of the things we do is we join it with a continents data set to place each of these countries uh, into their respective continents. This allows us to talk about data joins, which is sort of a, you know, a foundational thing when you're starting to work with data. Now that we're talking about countries, though, and joining two different data sets that have names of countries, inevitably there is some mismatch. Whatever year you're doing this, whatever data source you're doing this, my guess is you're going to get some mismatch. Sometimes that mismatch is going to be because of spelling differences. For example, every other data set you might look at the name of the country congo might be spelled differently um sometimes it is democratic Re democratic republic of the congo sometimes it's just congo so there's different ways that the name of the country shows up some of the other countries that we see on this slide that didn't match to the continent's data site uh data set is because the um name of the country may have changed, or it might be that not everyone agrees that that uh, particular entity is a country. So this allows us to talk a little bit about data science ethics as well, because as a data scientist, ultimately the students are going to have to make some decisions about which countries these data are going to, uh, which continents these data are going to go into. And they are bringing in their own sort of political views and whatnot as they're doing that, or they're risking losing um, the data that they had. Uh, so we generally decide that we're going to go with sort of like geographic placement and reassign these countries. Then we take the data visualization that we had started with and we talk about critiquing, uh, we critique this data visualization and then we work on improving it. So here we have an example of sort of looking at the share of aquaculture, so percentage of farm fishing in each of these country, uh, co uh, continents um, ordered an order of magnitude. So a lot more informative uh, representation of these data. And since we have geographic information here, this also becomes a wonderful opportunity to uh, give an example on mapping as well. Um, mapping generally requires bringing in two sources of data as well, the data on which uh, that you want to map and some shapefile information so that you can plot, um, you know, you can bring in the geographic information about this data. So it becomes an opportunity to review the joins that we just learned about and also learn about uh, making maps with R. And here's an example of a project um, that the students have worked on. This was, I think, last year, uh, where they took the skills they learned in this uh, unit, uh, the idea of making choropleth maps, and they explored the data set that they found was uh, looking at regional differences in average GPA and SAT scores. Um, and um, they had also other variables in their data set that they were doing some modeling to try to sort of like explain the differences here. Now let's go to another example. Um, in this example, <laughs> you can imagine that um, this was uh, during my time when I was living in Edinburgh. So maybe it's also an opportunity to highlight sort of the versatility of these for your local area uh, for some of these examples. So this also happened to be at the height of COVID. So I spent just about every day in the middle of the day listening to the briefings by the then uh, first minister of um, Scotland, uh, Nicola Sturgeon. And I started thinking, she has a very methodical way of sort of talking I wonder if we could do something with the text data here. So it turns out the text of each of these speeches are posted on the Scottish government website. And um, many governmental websites will post sort of texts like this. So there may be something local and of interest to you in your area that you might be able to sort of develop a similar example on. Um, and what we did was we took a look at each one of these speeches and first, uh, we use this to sort of like teach tech, uh, web scraping, which is a module that appears in the import um, unit of the um, of the course. So um, when you start doing web scraping, you inevitably need to touch a little bit on text parsing. Uh, we can see that some of the data fields that we're scraping from this web page are dates. Some of them are um, sort of like uh, paragraph text. So we to it's a, it becomes also an opportunity to talk about data types as well. 
there is no getting around uh, regular expressions when you start uh, talking about um, uh, text data, basically. So this becomes an opportunity to introduce those into the course as well. Then once we have some code that allows us to take the data from this one page, so one briefing, and put that into a row of our data frame in R, we then go back and say, well, how are we going to get the data from each one of these um, uh, speech speeches? So we functionalize the code that we've written. So this becomes an opportunity to introduce the idea of functions. And then we map this function over each of the URLs listed on this web page. And we get to talk a little bit about iteration to develop a data frame where each row is a speech and some metadata. And then in our columns, we have the text of that speech as well as some metadata about it. Then what? Then we visualize the data. So we step back and say, all right, we've imported the data. We've wrangled it into shape. Let's go back and visualize it. At the time, we looked at things like uh, how the length of the speeches were getting longer as we kept being in lockdown. Also looked at some uh, patterns of things like um, they, we used to call it social distancing. And then at some point in the life of the pandemic, um, the, the term became physical distancing. So we look for sort of like character matching to see when uh, the briefing stopped saying social distancing and went to saying physical distancing. Each one of these visualizations were also sort of generated with student input during a live coding session as well. Um, and then, um, remember the fur looking further unit that I talked about at the very end of the semester, we brought this data back in the classroom then. Text analysis is not necessarily a part of the sort of the uh, um, uh, primary curriculum for uh, an introductory data science course. It rarely is. Um, however, it's a great opportunity uh, to the, the end of the semester is a great opportunity to, to, to dig a little bit further into this. So um, we've also scraped then data from the UK speeches, so in England, and we compared um, the two speeches using a measure called uh, term frequency, inverse document frequency, which is commonly used in text analysis. You'll see some odd things here. For example, they kept saying, next slide, please, a lot in the UK speeches and never in the Scotland speeches. So that's one of the reasons. But also looking into these uh, visualizations, we can say things like the language in the UK was a little bit more um, flowery, if you will. Um, there were a lot of things like we will defeat this disease, we will sort of uh, uh, thrive out of this versus the Scotland speeches were very sort of um, scientific and methodical, mostly mentioning geographic areas in Scotland and some numbers being reported. So this became a good way to sort of like bring that data set back and um, also introduce a new idea um, that tends to be a popular sort of course that students like to take uh, further down in their studies. And since we talked about um, uh, data science ethics here, we can't, you know, um, overlook the idea of we're doing some day, uh, web scraping here, but should we be doing web scraping here? So before we even start any of this unit, we first ask, um, are we allowed to scrape these data? And so this becomes an opportunity to introduce to students, um, you know, how do you figure out whether you're even legally allowed to scrape some data? Uh, looking at the robots.txt uh, file uh, that's usually available on a website. But also this becomes a great foray into the next unit in the curriculum that's on data science ethics, um, where we then dive deeper into even if you are legally allowed to scrape them, some data, should you be scraping those data? And how should you then be sort of like uh, using or not using it in your analysis? And here's an example of another student project or a team project from students where um, they looked at um, sort of factors that are most important to university ranking. You can see this is an introductory data science course, lots of first year students here who have very recently sort of thought about things like SATs getting into college, which is the best college. And they're immediately putting the skills that they learned in this class into use to explore these questions. 
Um, so they were exploring factors uh, most important to university ranking. But in order to be able to do this, they um, went to this um, website that many of them had used called uh, Niche College Ranking List and scraped uh, data. Each one of those little boxes you're seeing on the website pertains to a university. So first they wrote some code to scrape data from a single university's page and then iterated it over those, just like we showed in the example with the briefings. And finally, our third example is on a spam filter. So this is a modeling example, a very sort of, um, you know, standard, if you will, um, example that we see in, um, you know, when we start introducing um, ideas like logistic regression. So um, we bring in a data set that is an, a corpus of emails. Um, and we have some metadata on these emails. Here in this visualization, I've shown you uh, just one of the uh, variables that's a candidate predictor for predicting whether an email is spam or not. And here we're looking at number of characters and sort of the, trying to predict the probability that the email is spam and looking at whether as the number of characters increases, the likelihood or the probability of the email being a spam increases or decreases. Um, this is our foray into logistic regression and we talk about doing prediction uh, on new emails and new data. So introduce the idea of taking a data set, uh, splitting it into testing and training components uh, training a model on the training data and then doing prediction for our testing data. So standard sort of like machine learning ideas um, and we introduce them to the students uh, early on in the data science course. But what else happens in this unit? Another thing we get to then talk about here is the idea of decision errors. So note that this is a topic that comes in the class uh, even before we get to hypothesis testing. and while decision errors are a very common sort of um, topic of discussion when we introduce hypothesis testing, it's my experience that it's not always um, very um, easy for students to sort of like wrap their heads around what it means for an assumed null hypothesis to maybe be true and maybe not be true. But when we introduce the idea of decision errors in a logistic regression and prediction context, something as simple as some emails may truly be spam, but they may be categorized as not spam or vice versa. This becomes something that is um, a lot sort of more straightforward for students to wrap their heads around. And then when this idea comes up again in the context of hypothesis testing later in the course, they've at least seen it and thought about it one other time. It's also a great opportunity to take these uh, predictions uh, from our testing data and calculate things like sensitivity and specificity, and then use those values to compare different models to each other to be able to start reasoning around which, which variables may yield models that have um, you know, higher sensitivity and specificity. And finally, this becomes an opportunity to talk about loss functions. Not that we're introducing different like L1, L2 loss functions in this course, but we start talking about how what may be uh, an okay email to miss for me may not be for somebody else. And that different people might have different thresholds for uh, classifying um, emails as spam or not spam. And, um, you know, we talk about sort of reasons of that, but we then also start to get the students to articulate how they could bring that into a modeling context. Um, all of that, then, you know, actually um, introducing different loss functions is not in the course curriculum, but it's definitely something they're going to see in a second course in regression or beyond. And this becomes an opportunity to leave the class sort of hanging, if you will, and saying that um, these are ideas that they can revisit in future courses. And here's an example of a, um, a, a team's work where they did logistic regression to predict uh, League of Legends success. League of Legends is a um, video game, I found out, once they did this presentation. And their question was something around, after 10 minutes into the game, whether a gold lead or an experienced lead was a better predictor of which team wins. 
if those words don't make a whole lot of sense to you, um, welcome to uh, my life. I actually am not very familiar with League of Legends. My um, experience with it is really limited to uh, what this team had presented at the time. But there are two reasons why I brought up this example. One, it's an example where they have a um, outcome variable that's binary. And one of the things they did as part of their project was logistic regression. But number two, they use the methods that they learned um, to, you know, get data off the web on a topic of interest to them. And this particular team, it turned out that all four of the students actually outplayed uh, this game and they were able to use the tools and the methods and techniques they learned in the class to um, explore a data set of interest to them. When we build uh, curricula and try to bring examples to class, I myself generally um, feel like I need to be bringing in examples that have sort of a um, you know social importance, if you will. And I think that that is a good approach for sort of faculty to be uh, developing course content. But I find it really heartening when um, students you know use these techniques for something that maybe not necessarily has a very huge societal importance but it is important for them and they you know uh, use these decision making tools to perhaps get better at the game that they are playing and here's another example of um, again using logistic regression and one of the reasons why I brought this example here as my last example from students is it was a project that didn't necessarily go as well as um, the students were hoping for. I mean, the project was good. The results weren't what they were expecting. Um, this was a critique of uh, Hollywood relation stereotypes and they were uh, wanting to, they were looking at um, age differences between stars and movies over time, and also looking at whether the relationship was a heterosexual relationship or not. Uh, one of the things the students uh, did not realize uh, when they first sort of like went down this path was that they were not actually going to find non heterosexual relationships in Hollywood movies when you date back to, um, you know, the 1950s and 60s, for example. So that was something that they learned along the way. Uh, but also they were able to, you know, once again, use their modeling skills to sort of like explore these data and be able to um, say something about them. All right, so we talked a lot about content, so let's switch over to pedagogy a little bit. Um, there's a lot that goes in this class, that goes on in this class, so I'm not going to try to take you, uh, you know, play by play of how we run the class, but there are a few things that I want to highlight. Uh, the first one is that a lot of the um, instruction happens via live coding. So before coming to class, students watch some videos um, and in those videos, um, you know, they are introduced to the ideas and sometimes they're seeing the instructor do live coding in the videos as well. And sometimes it's running through um, uh, lecture slides. But then in every lecture, um, we, along with time for students to attempt the exercises on their own, we have the instructors uh, live coding in the front of the classroom. And so the students are seeing the process along with the code. Uh, we're doing, you know, talking through ideas before we actually write the code to implement them. And importantly, we're involving them in the process of making decisions of our next steps um, before we actually, you know, bring up uh, pre can like set of slides for them uh, to walk them through an analysis. Another thing is that students are working in teams. Uh, weekly, they work in teams on labs. Uh, so these are computational labs, which is a analysis of a data set that highlights the tools and techniques that they got introduced to that week. Um, th throughout the uh, semester, they do periodic team evaluations that then they get to anonymously receive feedback from their teammates. And also the same team is, stays throughout, and this is the team that they're doing their term projects in um, at the end of the semester. So those term projects are the projects that I gave you some example of examples of throughout the talk. Um, 
Another thing that we do is this idea of a minute paper, which is a commonly used uh, pedagogical technique, I believe, in writing or discussion-based classes, where at the end of a lecture, students are asked to take a minute to sort of like put down their thoughts. Well, we use it a little bit differently in the class. The students take a weekly online quiz. Um, these quizzes are graded for uh, sort of attempt, not for uh, grades, but they are sort of like coding exercises or multiple choice questions mostly um, that cover that week's material. But the last question uh, that they need to answer is a brief reflection. So we ask them to take a minute to write about what they learned that week, what is clear and what's not clear, and um, also ask any questions um, that they may not have had a chance to bring up in other venues um, in the class. What I then do is, depending on the class size, I might read through these uh, reflections, but more often than not, the goal with the reflections is not for the instructor to read, but for the students to actually reflect. But the questions themselves are for the instructor to read. And sometimes I'm running these um, this uh, class with lots of students in it. I think for next semester, we already have almost um, you know over 250 students enrolled in the course, and chances are I'm not going to be able to read 250 50, you know, um, of these every week. So what I do is I then take that text data and run it through a little bit of code to um, make myself some bigrams and n-grams to take a look at common topics that appear as pain points and for the students. And those are the pain, uh, ideas that I sort of do a 10-minute recap on before I start the next week's material. Uh, students also do peer feedback, so they look at each other's work at various stages of the project and actually give feedback to each other. And an important component of the um, uh, uh, important aspect of the sort of the uh, pedagogical toolkit for this course is the idea of creativity. So when possible, we give assignments that make room for creativity. What do I mean by that? Well, it could be that term project. The TLDR of this term project is ask a question you're curious about and answer it with a data set of your choice. This is your project in a nutshell. There's a lot more information further down that to help the students like guide them through and help them with a little bit with their anxiety around uh, what they will be evaluated on. But ultimately, that's what we're asking the students to do. And they get to get creative with it, as you've seen in the examples. If this idea of um, you know doing an open-ended uh, project in um, an introductory data science course is of interest, we have a paper in the Statistics Education Research Journal um, on the five Ws and one H of term project in the introductory data science classroom that comes with um, sort of templates for these projects as well, both for peer review and for instructor review um, that you might be interested in. But sometimes we may not have the bandwidth for uh, doing these term projects for maybe a very large course or an understaff course where feedback is impossible. I encourage you even in those instances to, instances to look for pockets of opportunities of, for creativity. For example, one of my favorite uh, assignments to give is make an ugly plot. So this is a standard scatter plot that the students uh, try to uglify as much as possible. And the important thing here is that I never in this class teach students how to change the background color and stuff like that. So all of these little uh, nitty gritty of things that they learn about how to customize a ggplot2 to look this awful are things that they are doing by reading the documentation. So under the hood, this is an exercise about getting them to read the documentation. But the fun part is that they get to make something ugly and then vote on it at the end of the semester to see um, how who's has the ugliest plot and finally let's very briefly touch on tooling so the thing is we're doing a lot in this course throwing a lot of ideas to students we want the tooling to feel as minimal as possible so really all the students do is they have a browser-based access to R or our studio and they are submitting their work and working in github repositories for doing that this is a little dishonest, honestly. Really, once they get to uh, our studio and have access to it, they're obviously writing code in R, they're creating computational documents with Quarto, they're introduced to a 
you know, bunch of our packages, starting with the tidyverse and tidy models, but many more as well. And they're using Git, the command line interface under the hood as well. But all they're th uh, seeing is sort of the Git paint in our studio and pushing and pulling to their GitHub repositories. Um, how does this feel for them? Well, one of the challenges I give myself is that in the first 15 minutes of the class, students make their first data visualization. So this is what the first day of class looks like. Go to some URL, uh, either that's uh, something like Posit Cloud or the university interface that we have built the university servers and go and open up this project find the document in there uh, called UN Votes. This is a um, data set on how countries vote in the United Nations. Click Render and make the, your first visualization, which looks something like this. Three countries of choice that I have chosen for them. It becomes an opportunity for me to introduce myself to them as someone who grew up in Turkey, lived a bit in the UK, and now lives in the US. And then we tell them, go through the code for, oh, well, actually first talk to your neighbor about what's going on in this plot, how countries are voting on these issues in the United Nations, but then change the country, Turkey, to another country. So they have a bunch of code that they're looking at uh, that produces this plot, but we ask them to not worry about the code itself, but to make one modification to it and render it and get a plot of interest to them. So this makes them make their first data visualization in the first 15 minutes of the class. And then come week five or six of the class, we revisit this and they're able to actually create this visualization from scratch. And all of that is possible because they never had to install anything and they were able to go on their browser to a server where everything was set up for them, including the data set and the R packages that they're using and they're just rendering documents. And throughout the semester, we take away that scaffolding of providing lots of code for them and they build their skills to be able to do this themselves. And at the end of the semester, this is what one of their projects looks like. It's actually a web page that they can choose to make um, public and something they can uh, you know, link from their uh, resumes if they want. And it has, you know, their analysis and their visualizations, uh, so on and so forth. And we're able to do this because we're leveraging uh, GitHub as the sort of the container for their work. So in addition to learning computing and data science and statistics ideas, students are actually being introduced to good software and data science workflows as well. Um, and sort of learning Git and GitHub along the way. And we have a paper on sort of like incorporating these ideas into the uh, curriculum as well. All right, so we've talked about all three of these and let's wrap up by saying a few words about openness and scalability. If you're interested in teaching from this curriculum, I've been maintaining this project data science in a box uh, over the last almost perhaps four years or so. Um, and basically what it contains is all of the course materials, lectures, videos, homework assignments, sample exams for teaching this curriculum that are all openly licensed uh, for someone to use in full or take uh, pieces of. Um, you can see the learning units that we talked about are clearly identified here with lesson modules uh, for, uh, you know, for different lessons within each unit. Uh, there's a GitHub repository that serves this um, project with all the course materials and the source code that goes with them, as well as an R package that contains the um, interactive uh, learning quizzes, as well as the data sets that are used in the uh, project. And who is it for? Well, it could be for someone who's been using R for a while and wants to update their teaching materials, someone who's new to teaching with R and need to build up their course materials, or maybe someone who just came across a slide deck that was of interest to uh, them, perhaps you uh, listening um, and thinking maybe being intrigued by one of the examples I gave and want to sort of see the full course that um, this um, example lives in. And, you know, teaching this material alone is hard. So we also have a um, community on Slack of instructors who teach uh, from data science in a box, some of which contribute uh, as well with pull requests and corrections or suggestions to the materials, but also some who sort of hang out on Slack and generally ask lots of questions at the beginning of the semester. 
Um, and if you would like to see an example of this in action in one of the uh, Duke courses that I teach, I've linked to a course uh, website there as well. And um, there was a mention of a um, data science education journal uh, at the beginning of the talk. Um, uh, I think that sort of synthesizing these ideas in a paper form is also incredibly valuable and in submitting to venues like that. So we have a paper called A Fresh Look at Introductory Data Science in the Journal of Stats and Data Science Education that sort of summarizes and goes deeper into the content and tooling of the course. Thank you so much for listening, and I would be happy to answer any questions in the remaining time we have. Thank you very much. Yeah, very interesting. A lot of great material there and a lot of great stuff for teaching our own courses. But um, one of the questions that, uh, that came up, which I'm interested in as well, is where does this course fit in the curriculum? Uh, your, what is this part of a normal degree program or, well, just tell us about that. Yeah. So this is our, um, uh, it's a hundred level course. And for the stats major, we count this course as an elective for the major. Not every single one of our majors um, takes this course, um, but a large majority of them, and in fact, increasing percentage of them have been taking this course and finding it as a pathway uh, to uh, be a stats major, many of them with a data science concentration. The course is also required by a bunch of other majors as well. Uh, computer science requires it, for example. Um, it's not the only data science course necessarily computer science students take, but it's the one where they really dive into the statistical ideas as well. And I believe that's the reason why that department requires it, but also public policy, political science, and a bunch of other social science and natural science departments count the credit um, towards their majors. The way we see it in the statistics department is that it's a great introduction for students to the discipline uh, while they build their computation uh, in a way that they, where they build their computational and statistical thinking skills. And generally, we recommend that students who are wanting to be stats majors alongside this course are also doing one of their math prereqs as well. So a Calc 1, Calc 2, something like that, since the course doesn't require it. We also you know, always have some um, majors each in each year's cohort who come to our um, discipline and major through a probability pathway. Their first course perhaps is a more mathematical probability course. Um, that contingent is still there and that pathway into the major is still allowed. So for students um, who have already had, say, the calculus courses, uh, is, is there a second version of this that they often jump straight into or how do you... Um, they usually don't jump straight into anything else because the ideas in this course are very new to them, just as much as they're new to someone who haven't taken calculus, um, generally because they haven't done any computing before, or if they have, mm -hmm. it hasn't really been with data necessarily. Um, so no, however, should there be, uh, there is a second version, like a second level of this course at the 300 level, our statistical computing course, where we go deeper into sort of understanding and learning about R as a computing language. And also taught, you know, in that course, our, our ideas of like, you have, you know, computationally expensive model outputs. How do you store them? Where do you store them? That sort of, those sorts of aspects of statistical computing come up in that course, as well as things like optimization, for example, versus this is more the first, like, let's learn R as a mean to do things with data. Got it. Got it. Um, another question that uh, showed up was, um, can you tell us how the course compares to Berkeley's data? Mm -hmm course. Yeah, so I'm quite familiar with the Berkeley Data 8 course. I think, as you said, the obvious is R worth and versus Python difference. But beyond that, um, it, it I would say it's more statistical. Um, the ideas of uh, the statistical ideas are especially on the modeling side, I think I believe they do do um, uh, a bit of inference in the Berkeley uh, Data 8 course. But 
perhaps modeling not as much as we do so um, in STAT 199. Another, or and basically this curriculum, another difference is um, that uh, we teach them sort of reproducible computing. Berkeley Data course also uses computational notebooks, um, but this idea of sort of reproducibility, I don't know that it's like as sort of importantly highlighted throughout the um, semester, as well as version control is something we teach that I, I believe does not show up. And that's probably because the tooling is a little bit different on the R side versus Jupyter Notebook side for that. Um, on the other hand, the data aid course, I think does teach sort of Python as a programming language a bit more than we do uh, in this course as R as a programming language. Yeah, you mentioned that the digging into the R as a language comes in a subsequent. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. All right, well, I think we uh, all have a lot that we can go off in many directions and study more on. And Mene, we just really appreciate you being with us this evening. And uh, I want to thank you as well as the audience for joining us tonight. And um, I think, um, if do you have any final words you'd like to say before we sign off? Uh, no, I have linked to the um, the slide deck. Um, so if you go back and uh, look through the video as well, you'll see it at the end. And uh, that may be a good way to sort of grab the links to other things that I've mentioned along the way. And maybe I'll see some of you on the Data Science in a Box Slack later. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank, thank all you. of you. Good night.